Greetings, everybody. Uh, welcome to Build. I'm your host, Ricky Camilleri. Uh, it happens to most children as they grow older. The image of their parents as all seen and knowing fades, and the mom and dad become human. But in the new film, The Clove Hitch Killer, that vision of the perfect father fades into something else, something a lot more sinister, something made of nightmares. Let's take a look. You are the best young lady that he has brought home to meet us. Also the only one. Dad. <laughs> Not tying exemplifies the strength of a troop or family. How come Dad doesn't have to help with couponing? Because your father has his own hobbies. You know about that clovage stuff, right? Ten official victims. No fingerprints, no blood. Just the clove hitch tied to every victim's house. I've been meaning to talk to you. You know we're made in God's image. But men like you and me, we got thoughts. I don't think he stopped killing. I think there's more than ten victims. You can't control what pops into your head, right? He has pictures. I mean, what if a thought popped into your head right now? A bad thought. Does that look like your father's handwriting? Something like grabbing one of these tools and wham! There. Awkward talk with Dad. Over. You think your dad is Clovich? I don't know. Something's going on. Something bad. He's insane. It's just my dad. Maybe you don't know what a normal dad is like. She's manipulating you. Where are we going? Almost there, bud. Everybody, please welcome Charlie Plummer, Samantha Mathis, and director Duncan Skiles. Hey. Hi. Thank you so much for being here. Congratulations on the movie. It's terrifying. It's really terrifying, isn't it? Terrifying. It's very well made, and it isn't, um, I would say, it doesn't go for cheap thrills like most serial killer and uh, horror movies do. It's a very right. sophisticated movie, isn't it? Yeah. Especially for a first-time filmmaker. Thank you. Um, I'm very impressed with this movie and this man, and also this man. Of course. Uh, well, first off, you know, as someone who, uh, I hate to say this, has done, you know, their own research into serial killers quite regularly, you go down a rabbit hole on the internet and it's impossible not to read about a number of them. This feels very reminiscent of a few in the Midwest and the Pacific Northwest that people talk about occasionally who had families, they had uh, whole lives outside of this sort of like long running, years long murder spree that they were going, uh, that they were going. Is this at all influenced or based on any of those people? Yes. Uh, the serial killer with a family thing I thought was pretty compelling. And I um, thought it would be very interesting to tell it from the perspective of a family member who found out before anyone else. I prefer not to call out any serial killers because I know a lot, of them, a lot of them thrive on attention. So, yeah, that's where I'm at. And so when you're adapting it, uh, how much are you pulling from this? How much do you want to make sure that it doesn't come across like anything specific? Again, no, not calling anything out. Uh, well, there was one guy in particular where a lot of it came from, the Boy Scout thing, the, the church leader thing. Um, uh, yeah. OK, now talk about uh, Dylan McDermott's performance here, because we've seen him a lot. Very charming, uh, very handsome guy who uh, is very charismatic on camera. Um, I don't think we've ever seen him use his charisma this way. Was that something that you were thinking about when you cast him? Was it a guy who could sort of seduce and lure anybody and make them believe anything he wanted? Well, Dylan is very handsome and he has a ton of charisma, which made me kind of hesitant at first to cast him because I had a hard time believing him as an authentic Midwestern dad. It was very important that everything seemed kind of uh, real to me. Um, but he put himself on tape doing the accent and changed his hair. He created a lot of um, things about the presentation of the character, 
like the posture. And then I got very excited about transforming him physically uh, with a prosthetic belly and we shaved his hairline back. And so in the end, I'm very glad that uh, Dylan convinced me that he was right for the part because I think he did an amazing job. Did you expect him to bring so much humor to the part of the dad? Some of that was written in, but he was also a little bit of a prankster um, and very excited to try out ideas. I mean, he was excited to be a dorky dad. I think it was a little bit... Um, Must have been liberating for him. I mean, yeah. as weird as that sounds, to, to always be the handsome guy with the, the gorgeous blue eyes and, like, he got to do things he's never done before. It's an amazing performance, isn't it? For sure. Yeah, it really is. One of several. One of several. In, yeah. in, the, in the movie. Yeah, but I was surprised. We're getting to it. I was surprised <laughs> that when you cast him. I mean, it was really unexpected. I went, "Huh, I don't see it." You know, it's a bold choice. That's but how that's I what makes it really too, exciting. Yeah. I think to watch is like this is something you've never seen Dylan McDermott do before, and he does it so well. Yeah, Charlie, you play his son. Uh, you're sort of discovering uh, his potential secrets, uh, his potential, his potential dark, dark, dark secrets. Uh, what was it like working with Dylan? I loved working with Dylan. I we, we had gotten to meet up a few times before we started shooting and got to talk a lot through. And he's just a really smart guy. And I think, uh, you know, he really saw this as a wonderful opportunity for himself. And and I just think it's great when whenever you get to work with anyone who's passionate about the material and about the character. And we were really able to hash some things out before we got there. And then once we got there, he was just completely in it and invested every moment. And so that was just a blast for me to get to play with because of course, while my character's kind of having to react and observe a lot of what his character's doing throughout the film, I, I really was getting to do that as the character but also as an actor as well and, and, and that provided a really good time for me. But well, this is the second performance of yours this year where most of what you're doing is kind of internal monologue mm. uh, and is about someone who has a lot of quiet focus and is just sort of registering the world around them and how it's changing or how it's closing in. What do you think drives people to casting you in, the, in those parts? Or are you, are you interested in parts like that specifically? Well, I think I'm certainly interested in, in those kinds of things because I think uh, that's just personally my taste. I think a lot of the, the movies that I respond to uh, have characters that you know aren't necessarily uh, forward with everything that they're thinking and everything that they're seeing. And, and therefore, it really allows the audience, in, in my eyes, to, to come in and, and be a character in, in the story just as much as your, your lead character is. And so I think I always respond to scripts that are maybe more in that vein. But I don't know. I mean, I guess that's more of a question for Duncan than anybody else why he would want to cast me in that kind of a part. But I just loved the script. I thought it was such a smart script. And like you said before, uh, it's not sentimental about anything. It doesn't make a scene out of anything, and I think that's even more horrifying. And I think I'm just interested in material like that in general. No, it's austere. It's it's definitely cold and sort of calculating, so it is horrifying in that way. It's not that you were going to say something? Well, I, I was just going to say, I think as an actor, you know, I mean, it's wonderful to work with great words um, and, uh, and to do that kind of material, but it's also wonderful to have the challenge of saying things without saying words. And I think that, that Charlie exudes, y y I mean, he eats up the screen and you can see that there's an inner life in him. And you have to see an inner life in an actor in order to have the trust to cast them in something where there's so much going on they're not saying. But as an actor, that's always the most fun, is the things that you're not saying. Because we often don't say what we're thinking, right? or we're thinking something completely different than what we're saying. Anyway, so that's why Charlie, I think, was cast in both those movies, because he has that ability, and not everyone can do that. Yeah. You, uh, you play Charlie's mother and Dylan's uh, wife in this, and uh, I wonder you know, how, much she, how much she knows about his, his secrets. This was certainly a topic of conversation between Duncan and I. I don't think she knows, but she knows something. I think that it is really complicated to be in a relationship with a sociopath, and sociopaths are very good at convincing you that you're crazy, um, and that there is no problem, and they're very good at charming you and compartmentalizing, and so, you know, they have this perfect life. If, you, if she pulls back the curtain and 
trusts her gut in any way, you know, it would destroy everything. So I don't think she knows, but their marriage isn't perfect. I think, she, I think she knows a little bit about what he's into. Not the, yeah. not the um, I mean, there's sex murder like thing necessarily, but the uh, kind of like kink. And then, and then she discovered that a while ago and then devoted her life to fixing him through faith and therapy. And that's a narrative that he's gone along with. And it held him in good stead for a really long time. What's that? It held him in good stead for a really long time. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it, it is partially effective. I always get confused about how we're supposed to talk about this. Uh, you mean Whether for spoilers? Is. Yes. Yeah. I think it's pretty clear now. I think, I think it's pretty clear, right? Um, <laughs> and this is a, we can Forget just everything say, you've heard. This is, this is the story of a son discovering that his father is... Yeah. Not, yeah. Oh, not there we go. Okay, we'll stick to was. the non-spoiler. Who knows? Route, yeah. then. Okay. That's right, man. You know, there's a there's a lot of uh, there's been a lot of serial killer movies over the years. Some very famous, some non very famous, some some not that famous that are that are still quite good. Were there any that you looked at in terms of inspiration for this? Yes. Uh, there's a scene in Zodiac by the lake. There's a couple having a nice moment, and it's a beautiful. Uh, day with golden light and there's no music and um, this figure wearing um, a mask just approaches from afar and he just walks up to them and the scene gradually becomes uh, pretty horrifying and, and that to me very very much stuck with me because of the way it was done very matter-of-factly um, that clinical you can feel every stabbing in that in that scene yeah I kind of hate it um, and then uh, it's, but it was that, that was just like a less is more approach. And uh, Funny Games by Michael Haneke, which is also a horrifying event that takes place in a very pleasant environment. And so I, was, I, I went for something that was like mostly in the day and had as little music as possible and had sort of a matter of fact approach. Because for me personally, that was more scary than the typical tropes of the genre like the music and the dark shadows. Well, the music and the dark shadows give so much away. When it's a matter of fact, you're not exactly sure what's going to happen or how it's going to happen or where the f how much the filmmaker is going to show you. And that kind of becomes... All those questions end up becoming what's scary about the scenario. Yeah, that was the intent. Yeah. So you were th I'm sorry, go ahead. Somebody. No, and also funny. I mean, there's some really funny stuff in this movie, but you don't hit it over the head. So as a viewer, you're kind of like, wait, Oh, am I supposed to be laughing? Oh my God, this is hysterical. Oh my God, I am terrified right now. You don't really know and you don't hit it over the head as a filmmaker, which I think audiences appreciate. And um, I think it makes it that more scary and that much more funny. And in fact, I was talking about this yesterday. You know, has a, it reminds me a little bit of American Psycho in that way, an, another movie that I was in, where you know it's deeply disturbing and yet you're hysterically laughing at certain moments. Yeah. yeah. The the murder scene that you're that you're that we were talking about just a second ago reminds me a lot of Funny Games. That's interesting. I'm glad that you said that because then I was watching it. it. Was I was thinking this filmmaker has seen Funny Games just in terms of how austere and how matter of fact it is, and the idea that violence is really messy and like the biggest mistake serial killer movies make and horror movies make is when it's not is when it's very slick and polished rather than messy and people are falling all over each other and trying to figure out where to go and what to do and that becomes the terrifying aspect as well. Mm -hmm. How did you block that with, with, with Dylan and the actress? For this scene? <laughs> uh, <laughs> golly. Um, well, how'd you do that? Well, I told her to lay down on the couch <laughs> and then I told Dylan to slowly approach as if that were, we don't know who that is in there. Um, and, uh, <laughs> well, look, Maybe back to that point. Yeah, we really don't know what's it's gonna a, happen in this movie. It's not a whodunit. Yeah. The, the concept was never to string people along with that question. It's more about what would you do. Um, so that's how I'm gonna justify it, what I've said so far. far that might be spo spoilers. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, um, this was a collaborative effort as was this entire movie, uh, with the cinematographer, Luke McCubrey, who made it look this amazing, and the production designer, Letitia Duart, 
um, who also contributed to how memorable that this looks, like in Pleasant. And, and I feel like the, the entire movie, the caliber of the cast and the, the, the crew just made me uh, fire on more cylinders than I had been before. And I'm very thankful for you guys, for the amazing job that you did. Back at ya. Right back at you. So Charlie, you were talking about meeting with Dylan before and sort of talking everything out. Was this the kind of film where you guys had to move fast and you weren't really able to rehearse on set and so it made sense that you met beforehand and talked? I, I feel like we, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't remember it being particularly rushed. I mean, the one thing that was helpful about that was I did, I had just shot this movie Lean on Pete, yeah. but I wrapped on that like two weeks before we started shooting this. So once I got there, it was pretty quick in terms of the prep beforehand. But then once we were on set, I think it was pretty relaxed. I mean, the cast is pretty small and, um, you know, not too many locations. And so no we were chases, able... Chases, you no know. No car chases. Family dinners. Yeah, and exactly. Kids hanging out in a parking lot talking to each other. Yeah, we were in Kentucky, so everything was a little bit more laid back. And, and I think Duncan was just really great because I think he really let us kind of do our thing and, and work things out with each other and... Um, and like I said, I mean, it was great having Dylan and Samantha really being able to set the tone, I think, for a young And character. Madison, too. Oh, like and Madison, Your scenes yeah, with completely. Madison Beatty, I think, are so just startlingly honest, you yeah. know? Um, I think that's really what we really wanted to go for with this movie in general, was just to have something be really honest. And that, I think, is kind of the most terrifying, especially when it gets really scary. It's, I, I think the reason why people will be freaked out is because of how honest things are depicted, truthfully, and not, like you said, the opposite of slick and cut together, really, really just letting you, almost you feel like you're, you're watching something you really shouldn't be watching, and I think that's something that's really mm. interesting about this. Mm. You're, you're saying really slice of life. Di yeah, it dives into the idea of this would be, you really feel this would be horrible if this was happening to you or this person in, in real life, that they were having to discover yeah. this about someone. And it doesn't feel so distant. Like, I think a lot of horror movies can, you know, feel like, oh, that's a film. And I think this really, hopefully, will get audiences to feel like, wow, this could really happen to me. This exact scene could play out in my own house. My dad. My dad's a good guy. It's <laughs> not happening to him. Or no. is Do you he? really know that? Do you? <laughs> Too lazy. He's not really up to anything. Uh, <laughs> that's what a sociopath would convince you. They're really good at that. As I leave the room, he gets up and fixes the house and does really great things. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> Daniel, what was the hardest part about getting the movie made or making the movie? It took a long time to get this movie made because I don't really have anything on my resume that's like it. I mean, I have a background in horror comedy. Um, so just getting people to believe that I could do it, um, getting it cast, particularly uh, the role of Don, it took a couple of years uh, and because uh, I think because of what the character has to do. Um, so I, I did make what was called a scary for actors. Was it scary? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a, you have to kind of expose yourself. Um, and then uh, I did make what's called a mood reel where you take clips from other movies uh, and then sort of make a, a, a trailer for this one to, for how the story is going to go and how it's going to feel. And that helped open some doors. Um, I think the main challenge while we were shooting was that I was very careful about um, the violence and how much I would show versus how much I would suggest. Because uh, I'm not particularly comfortable with it or into it, but I wanted it to be realistic and I wanted it to get to, to a point that you, you felt like you wanted it to, to end, right? So that was kind of difficult finding that calibration. Did you find that when you were on set, just shoot more and then find in the edit what you, where you wanted to go? Um, no, we had very little time to shoot that sequence. So um, it was more of like, the, I mean, the actress, Kat Hernandez, she did a great job, but she was kind of freaking out because she was really tied up. And um, I, as a director, need to push to make it more realistic, but also don't want to put cat through that, right? You're also a nice guy. <laughs> right. And um, uh, so that was that was just a challenging couple of days. Yeah. Well, let's get some questions from our audience. Who's a question? Hey there. Hi. Um, this question is more for Charlie. Um, earlier you mentioned working on Leaning on Pete, uh, Lean on Pete, and I just wanted to know what the, the, what the transition was like working from Lean on Pete to the Clovage Killer, a horror film. 
Yeah, I mean, it, it was really different. I think tonally, you know, Lean on Pete's a movie that has the structure of its kind of, I mean, it, it's different than anything I've done. And I think with this, it's it's much more pointed in terms of, you know, what the story's about and the journey for my character. And, um, and I think also what this character is having to deal with mentally is completely different than what my character in that film was having to do. So it really was, but I, you know, I was actually, I met, Duncan about this script, I think when I was like 15 or 16. I w it was a long, long time ago. So I had been thinking about it for a long time and, I, I, and we had met up many, many times. And like I said, we met up with Dylan as well. So it was kind of in my headspace for a while. Um, and then honestly, I mean, like I said, I really can't give any more credit to Samantha and Dylan and Madison and, and all the other actors because I think once I showed up and just saw how invested they were and committed to making this as truthful as it could be, I was, I, I just wanted to follow their lead. And so that was a real benefit. But I think tonally, you know, totally different films. And so it was kind of, it took me a second to go, okay, this is, this is not the same set. Because for a second it did feel like I just took a break and okay, here we're back on the set of Lean on Pete. But that's not, that's not it at all. So it was pretty different. I think I have time for one more. Hi. Um, thank you for being here. My question's for Duncan. There are a lot of different themes in this movie, whether it's dealing with religion, the idea of the family unit, the idea of like double identity and like discovering um, who you know may not actually be like who you think they are. So I was wondering, what do you think the biggest takeaway of this film is? Well, for me, um, it was, um, I guess I'm, kind of interested in uh, people who are able to uh, lie very easily and uh, and how do we respond to that? I guess this idea of uh, when you feel very, when you feel like you know somebody and then you have a moment when you realize you don't know them, that's a very scary feeling to me. Um, and And so that kind of was the central idea that like, what, what do you then do about that you know to move on I guess yeah guys congratulations on the film I loved it it's called the clove hitch killer when can people check it out tomorrow tomorrow online and in movie theaters that's right opening right. in LA and New York tomorrow and that's then we'll be dropping online in, as well and in Grand Rapids so Michigan and Iowa City and Orlando yeah. a lot of places Check it out, y'all. It's really scary. It's really good. I'm it's in good it, movie. and I was yeah, terrified yeah. watching it. Give him a big round of applause, everybody. Let's yeah. hear it. Yeah.